All right, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We're good. Woo, it's 11.45. I say that to myself because maybe I'll keep track. Who knows? We'll see. My goal today, we're going to talk a lot about the festival of Shavuot, Pentecost, right? We talked about this is the festival of many names. It's the Feast of Weeks, right? It's the Feast of Harvest. It's the Feast of First Fruits. Okay? We're going to talk. It's, it's also, I mentioned in weeks past, it's Atzeret, which means the closing assembly, the closing festival, because this is seen as the close on the whole Passover season. Okay? We're going to talk about another title for Shavuot today, which is going to lead us into just some beautiful, beautiful ideas really meet. I mean, this is, you're going to see Acts 2 in a whole new light. With God's help, we're going to see Acts 2 in a whole new light. And I want to share about it today so we can be ready next week uh, for Shavuot. My goal today is that when you think of the Mount Sinai experience in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, and when you think of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the temple in Acts chapter 2, Right? The apostles receiving tongues of fire, speaking in multiple languages. My goal is that you would see these pictures, these events. Like, do you remember in school the projector and the laminated slides? And you could put one over another. You could overlay them. With God's help, my goal is that you would see these pictures and these events as overlaid. And how connected they are with each other. The giving of the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Shavuot, on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. I even said it right. <laughs> that's, my, my, that's my southern evangelical upbringing. Now, I'm going to read uh, just a quick review. Leviticus chapter 23. And I'm going to read, starting from verse 15. It says, You will count from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths will be complete. Even to the day after, the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you will number 50 days, and on the 50th day you will offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You will bring out of your habitation Two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They will be of fine flour. They will be baked with leaven. They are first fruits to the Lord. That's what Leviticus 23 has to say. It goes on a little bit farther, but that's basically what the chapter has to say about the festival of Shavuot. Okay? Again, as a refresher, Shavuot means weeks. And it refers to the count of seven weeks between the Passover holiday and the new festival of Shavuot. The title, another title, another name that the Jewish people call Shavuot is, is what I want to talk about today that I haven't discussed yet. The Jewish people call this holiday Zman Matan Toratenu. The season of the giving of the Torah. The season of the giving of the Torah. Why? Why do they call it that? That's one question I want to answer. Two, how is the festival of Shavuot connected with the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai? And how does this information connect to the events in Acts chapter 2? Okay. And when I say the events in Acts chapter 2, let me read to you quickly what I am talking about. This is Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, came, they were all together in one place, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Those are the events that I'm talking about when I say the events in Acts chapter 2. Okay? There was this miraculous event that took place 50 day, 49 days right after the resurrection of the Messiah. He had told them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And then on that day, Shavuot, Pentecost, this event happened that we just read. Okay? This is what I want to really get to today is the significance behind the events that happened on that day. In order to do that, in order to move forward, we have to go back. We have to go back farther. So if you have a Bible, and this is a lot of scriptures today, but it's important. That's how we learn. If you want to flip with me to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1. While you're flipping there, I will say, the Jewish people see Shavuot, they see the festival of weeks as the day that God came down on Mount Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments to the entire nation. This is how they see Shavuot. And I would submit it's how we should see it as well. Okay. Where in the Hebrew Scriptures, or what in the Hebrew Scriptures clues us in, what in the Old Testament clues us in that the giving of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, happened on Shavuot. Not much. There's not a whole lot. If you look with me in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. I'm going to keep reading through verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready for the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud blast of a shofar, a ram's horn. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Notice in this passage that we just read, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, it mentions that the people of Israel arrived in the Sinai desert on the first day of the third month, the biblical third month. This is the month that actually we're getting ready to enter into tonight. Okay, Shavuot is the festival that takes place in the biblical third month. Okay? That really is our only clue in the Hebrew Scriptures that the festival of Shavuot was the day when God came down on Mount Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments. Okay? Now, I'm going to read to you from Exodus chapter 20. Okay? I'm going to read Exodus 19 is when the Holy One comes down on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1, is when God begins to speak to the nation the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
Now, I'm going to pause there and I'm going to skip down. If you're following with me, I'm in Exodus chapter 20. And now I'm going to read verse 18. This is right after the Holy One finishes speaking the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. Verse 18, it says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the shofar, the ram's horn, and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Later on in the book of Deuteronomy, it's recorded that God praised them for the level of reverence they had at that moment. It's a little backwards from the way people often think when they read this passage, they think, well, you should draw near. Why, why would you stop God speaking to you? You have to understand this event the Holy One of the King of all creation descending into our physical reality and revealing Himself to an entire nation in fire and smoke and booming thunder. This is the most important event that ever has happened in human history. When God revealed Himself to a nation and revealed His character to, him, to them and revealed how He wants to be worshipped. Everyone wonders in the world, don't they? What is God like? Is there a God? What does He want from me? For the people of Israel, they don't have to guess at all. Because He descended onto Mount Sinai and spoke to the entire nation at once and said, this is who I am. This is what I desire. This is a turning point in human history. That's how significant this event is. Okay? What I want to point out in these passages that we just read. Thank you, Father. just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. So the people exhibited reverence is the closing thought that I was going to share about that when they said, Moses, you speak to us. We'll trust you. We trust you, Moses. You speak to us. But we fear God. We're afraid we might die in this encounter. This incredible, awe-inspiring encounter with God. Later on in Deuteronomy, it's recorded that God praised them for that level of reverence that they had in that moment. And He proclaimed, He said, Oh, that they would always fear Me this way. To do what I say. Yeah. But, in this passage in verse 18 of chapter 20, it says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning, Question, how does one see thunder? <laughs> how do you see thunder? We can make sense of seeing lightning, I get that. But how do you see thunder? The English translation has smoothed out the Hebrew a little bit. Rightfully so, there's nothing wrong with the English translation. Because I'm sure, at a fundamental literal level, there was a lot of thunder and lightning and fire going on when the Holy One descended from heaven. Okay, But the Hebrew of verse 18 literally says this, And all the nation was seeing the voices and the flames, and they heard the voice or the sound of the shofar. This is interesting. It says the nation was seeing the voices. Now, English translators have smoothed that out to say they saw the thunder, okay? The voices. But literally there, the Hebrew word is kolot, which is voices, okay? And then the word that's translated as lightning, in Hebrew it's lapidim, which means the flames, or even the torches, Okay? So think about it for a moment because the ancient, so the, the ancient commentators for the people of Israel, they read this text literally. It says, when the people saw the voices and the flames, this should start to connect some dots for us. Voices and flames. Right? 
from this verse, okay, and maybe you know, this verse is related to it. It's kind of a what came first, the chicken or the egg. But from ancient times, the Jewish people have maintained a tradition okay, that on Shavuot, that was the day that God came down and gave the Torah to His people Israel. And the people saw voices and flames on that day. I'm going to read to you from some traditional ancient commentary. Okay, this what I'm reading from you was only written down several hundred years after the New Testament. Okay. Keep in mind too, when I read from traditional sources, and I've explained about that in the past, just because a traditional source is written down several hundred years after the scriptures. It doesn't mean that the tradition that's being recorded doesn't go back even farther, much, much farther, because of the strength of oral tradition. Okay, For the Jewish people, before things were put to writing, they were passed down from generation to generation to generation. And oral tradition is a much, much stronger What's the word I want to use? It is much, much stronger than our idea of when we were in school and we had the telephone game. You remember that? Where you get all your kids to line up and one kid whispers, I like ladybugs. And by the time you get to the end, one kid whispers to another, one kid whispers to another, and by the time you get to the last kid and he announces what he thinks the message is, he says, ducks are my favorite. What? And you go, what happened in the chain of transmission? And the goal in that game oftentimes really is to get something that is wildly different than how it started. But you have to understand ancient oral tradition is, is a very different concept entirely. Okay? Uh, there's a text, there's a traditional text where a rabbi is describing the process of memorizing a teacher's words. And he says, a student, a disciple, who memorizes or repeats his master's words a hundred times is not as worthy as the student or disciple who memorizes or repeats his master's words a hundred and one times. This is the idea behind oral tradition, is that it was ingrained in your memory so that it could be passed on reliably to the next generation. All that to say... There's a, listen to this, this traditional commentary that's speaking about the day that God came down on Mount Sinai. Okay. And it is stated, and all the people saw the sounds, literally the voices, and here's the commentary. It says, it's not written sound, but rather sounds. Or to say it another way, it's not written voice. The, it doesn't say the people heard a voice but it says they saw voices. Rabbi Yochanan said, the voice of God would go out and divide into 70 voices for the 70 languages so that all the nations would hear. And each and every nation would hear in the language of that nation. And when they heard it, their souls would depart. But Israel heard it and they were not injured. So, the last part may be a little cryptic for us, but the point that I want to get across in reading that to us is that the Jewish people maintained a tradition for millennia that when God descended on Mount Sinai, He did so on the day of Shavuot. And when He spoke, His voice divided into 70 languages why 70? Because according to how the Jewish people think about the way that the world is divided, they see 70 nations. The number 70 refers to all the nations of the world. So a tradition has been maintained that when God descended and spoke the Ten Commandments, that it divided out into 70 languages for all the nations of the world to hear. Okay? Here's another example 
from another traditional source. It says, similarly, the school of Rabbi Ishmael taught with regard to the verse, they're, they're commenting on a verse in Jeremiah chapter 23. And this verse says, Behold, is my word not like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that shatters rock? Just as this hammer breaks a stone into several fragments, so too each and every utterance that emerged from the mouth of the Holy One at Mount Sinai divided into 70 languages. So think about the imagery that they just gave. They're talking about, imagine a blacksmith, okay, who is working on a piece of metal there at an anvil, right? He's got a white hot piece of metal and he's trying to straighten it out, he's trying to temper it, so he's beating on that metal. And every time he beats on that white hot piece of metal, what happens? Sparks fly. Right? What this traditional commentary is saying is that when God came down on Mount Sinai, it was just the same way. God would speak and his word would divide into sparks that represented 70 languages. Wow. This is kind of cool. So, we have this picture that on Shavuot, God descended on Mount Sinai, revealed himself to the entire nation. When he spoke, it was like sparks, like flames that would go out. And they divided up, and they divided into 70 languages so that all of the world could hear. So now, when I read to you in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Wow. I've got a little bit more time and I've got some notes that I want to share to continue to explain on this to get us ready for next week when we hear Acts chapter 2. But what I wanted to get across this morning as an idea is outside of the context of the Jewish people's perspective about Shavuot, and how it's connected to the giving of the Torah in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. Outside of their perspective on how exactly the giving of the Torah happened. The events of Acts chapter 2 are difficult to explain. It's difficult to understand the significance. We know, okay, imagine that you don't know what I just shared about. And maybe we're a new believer and maybe I read Acts chapter 2. And I see, okay, it was the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down. It looked like fire. This fire divided. The people started speaking in different languages. Oh, wow, that is awesome. Why? Why did that happen that way? Why did it happen on Pentecost? What is Pentecost? Right? As a new believer, we could ask a whole lot of questions. And outside of the Jewish people's perspective, we wouldn't get a whole lot of answers. Right? But now we can understand. Imagine being a pilgrim there at that Shavuot in Jerusalem. You've come to the temple to worship from Rome or from Babylon. Right? And all of a sudden, you see this group of Galileans. First, before you see them, you hear the incredible sound that's come from heaven. Something that is just loud and violent. And then all of a sudden you see this group of Galileans. 
And what looks like fire has descended on each one. And all of a sudden they're speaking in a language that you know is spoken in your hometown. Right? Imagine being a Jewish person and growing up hearing every year about the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And how it was an experience like no other. And how all the world heard the Ten Commandments in their own language. Because God's word divided out. And you're taught this year after year after year. And then you arrive there for that Shavuot. And then you see an event that you have only heard about. Okay? When in growing up in, in, in hearing and, and learning kind of traditional interpretations or traditional understandings of Acts chapter 2, I've often heard it called the birth of the church, right? The birth of the Christian church began at Acts chapter 2, okay? It was a, a beginning of something new. I would submit to you from the Jewish people's perspective, Acts chapter 2 was a reenactment of something very old, very ancient. And it brought to life before their very eyes an event that they had only ever heard about. Okay? Just as God descended on Mount Sinai in all of His glory, so at that moment in Acts chapter 2, His Spirit descended in the sight of all of the people who had come there to worship at the temple. And just as before he had revealed to them his Torah, now he's revealing to them his king, Yeshua. He revealed his Torah with such fanfare and such supernatural awe that the people of Israel, it was burned into their memory forever afterwards. Whether they listened or not, it was an event that would never ever be forgotten among the generations. Even so, in Acts chapter 2, God repeated that and revealed himself to the people in Jerusalem and proclaimed his son as the Messiah through the apostles in all the languages of the nations. So that whether the Jewish people would listen, whether they would not, it would be an event that would never be forgotten. The events of Acts chapter 2 represented the most significant corporate revelation of God to the Jewish people, you could almost say since the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. This wasn't the Master Yeshua revealing Himself to an apostle here or a group there. This was God's Holy Spirit revealing His will to His nation. Just as He had done so long before. The Holy Spirit poured out on disciples of Yeshua is a first fruit of the coming day when the Master returns and the whole world will be filled with His presence. And the knowledge of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. When God gave His Torah at Mount Sinai to Israel, the tradition goes that the whole world heard it. But who received it? Who latched on? The people of Israel. Now there's coming a day in God's coming kingdom when the whole world is going to live according to the will of the Master. But throughout history, so far in this present age, it's been the people of Israel who've carried the Torah, carried it with them wherever they go. In the same way, in Acts chapter 2, when God poured out His Holy Spirit, okay, His presence, His Holy Spirit will be poured out in its absolute fullness at the time when the Messiah returns and sets up God's kingdom on this earth. At that time, all of God's people will be prophets. At that time, everyone will know the Lord. Just like Jeremiah 31 says, nobody's going to have to teach anyone anymore to say, do you know the Lord, the God of Israel? Everyone's going to have a picture-perfect idea 
of who the God of Israel is. But until that day, the disciples of Yeshua from generation to generation carry with them the first fruits of that giving of the Holy Spirit. This connection with God. Okay. Before I wrap up, this was a little bit of a side note, but it's so good and I, I really want to share it. I've got just maybe three or four more minutes, so I want to do this. Another way that Acts chapter 2 is typically read, that we picture in our minds, okay, from a, from a Christian perspective, is when the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2, where are the apostles? In the upper room. In the upper room. Because in Acts chapter 1, it talks about the apostles being in an upper room, conducting business and praying together. And then in Acts chapter 2, it says they were all together in one place. And so I've often heard, and you see, whenever you look up a, an image or an artistic rendition of the apostles being filled with the Holy Spirit, often they're inside of a room. But Acts chapter 2 does not say they were in the upper room. It says they were all together in one place. When suddenly a sound came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Where were they sitting? Where were they? Where they could be in a place where thousands upon thousands of Jewish people could hear them proclaiming the deeds of the Lord. Where would God expect His people to be on a festival day? In the temple. Where are you going to have the ability and the capacity to immerse 3,000 new disciples in water? At the temple. At the temple. On that day, the apostles, along with the rest of their Jewish brothers, had congregated there at Shavuot to worship God as He commanded by appearing in His presence at the temple. Okay. So that's why I show in these pictures, and I want us to be able to have it in our mind. Whenever you read Acts chapter 2 now, I want you to see it as throngs and throngs of the people of Israel surrounding the temple and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit of God fills this place in a holy awesome reenactment of this event that happened so long before on Mount Sinai. I'll leave you with this. This passage is from 1 Kings chapter 8 if I'm not mistaken. In verse 10, this passage is when King Solomon dedicated the first temple to the Lord. Okay? What happened when Solomon dedicated the first temple? There was a big fanfare. All of Israel had gathered for this. It says, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said He would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell forever. One of the names of the temple is Habait. The house. Whenever you go to Israel, Jerusalem, if you are blessed and privileged to go, you are you have the opportunity to visit the Temple Mount, which in Hebrew is called Har Habayit, the hill or the mount of the house. So when Acts chapter 2 says the sound came from heaven and it filled the whole house. Not only is this event in Acts chapter 2 echoing the Sinai experience, it's echoing events like the dedication of the first temple. When Solomon dedicated a dwelling place to the Lord and all of a sudden his presence came 
and filled the house. In the same way that God's presence filled reality, filled Mount Sinai, filled the temple of Solomon, filled the second temple and filled the apostles in Acts chapter 2, may God's divine presence, may His words being spoken to us, may His Holy Spirit fill us up in this present generation as disciples of Yeshua so that we can be empowered to do mighty things for the sake of His name. Amen. So we will leave it there. Thank you all very much for hanging in with me.